Thankfully, after four years of med school, three years of an internal medicine residency, I'm in my first of my three years of a cardiology fellowship. In this video, I'm gonna help break down the logistics of what it takes to get into a cardiology fellowship and how to become a cardiologist in the US because even though it sounds very simple of go to med school, get into residency, get into a fellowship, become a cardiologist, it really isn't laid out in stone and it's not that simple. I'm also gonna to try to break down the various subspecialties in cardiology and then also break down the most important and biggest part of this video is gonna be tips for internal medicine residents on how to apply successfully or competitively for a cardiology fellowship. And then I'll also take a step back for the med students in general on tips on how to apply for residency and specifically for those who think that they have an interest in a subspecialty uh, after medicine. So stay tuned if you're looking to go into cardiology, learn more about how to become a cardiologist or simply a med student looking to figure out what residency program they want to go into. So in order to become a cardiologist in the United States, you have to, again, complete four years of med school, three years of internal medicine, and another three years of a cardiology fellowship. That lets you become a general non-invasive cardiologist. That means that you're gonna be someone who, if someone says, I need to see a doctor, but specifically, I need to see a cardiologist, you're the person that they're probably gonna see. Someone who can see an array of things that any type of general cardiologist is gonna see. The subspecialties within cardiology that require further years of training after your three-year general cardiology fellowship include interventional cardiology, electrophysiology, heart failure, cardiac oncology, and advanced imaging. All of those specialties require a minimum of one, and with regard to specifically electrophysiology in most programs, another two years of training. Without going into superfluous detail about the differences between each subspecialty of cardiology, let's focus on what this video is about, which is how to get into a non-invasive cardiology program to begin with. So what are the most important aspects of a cardiology fellowship application that internal medicine residents should be focusing on? The first thing right off the bat should be obvious is that you have to be an internal medicine resident. So if you're a med student thinking, do I wanna do family medicine or internal medicine? Just know that if you go into family medicine, you have no possibility of becoming a cardiologist. Only internal medicine residents can subspecialize into all the various subspecialties, including cardiology, rheumatology, gastroenterology, and all the other specialties. Family medicine is more restricted in the subspecialties that they can apply to. So before I go actually go any further, I'm just gonna throw out this disclaimer that I think should be obvious, but I think still needs to be said, is that I'm not a program director. I'm not the one picking and choosing the different people that we're gonna be interviewing and then selecting. It'd be great if a program director made this video, but in lieu of that, I'm gonna be talking on behalf of all of my experiences and everything that I've seen over my career so far. So you're applying for cardiology, what are the most important things in your application? Unfortunately, for better or worse, your pedigree still matters. So for my fellow Caribbean students, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but it still carries with you that if you went to a Caribbean med school, it still hurts you in fellowship. Don't get me wrong, I've said it multiple times before. I don't think that going to a US MD or DO school versus a Caribbean school makes you a better doctor, a worse doctor, but the simple facts are certain programs are simply not gonna look at you simply because you went to a Caribbean med school. It is what it is. Other things that you're not really gonna be able to change at this point are your board scores. So if you failed step one or step two, you better rock step three. There was an interesting a survey of program directors that looked at fellowship applicants and the majority of them did not care that much about your step three scores unless they mattered and let me reiterate that if you fail a step score they want to see that you did better and again I'm speaking in general but if I was a program director that's what I would want to see is that you learned from your mistakes and that's the same thing that goes back to residency application if you fail step one, I need to see that you crush step two, that you learn from your mistakes. And although this again has almost no cadence to if you're gonna be a good doctor or not, that there's no real correlation at all between having strong step scores and being a good or bad doctor. But what is important is that when you become a specialist, you can't sit for your boards in that specialty if you haven't passed your internal medicine boards. Again, doesn't really have any big major difference to me, but it is what it is and that's part of the system that we have. Another really important thing that you probably can't change at this point is what residency you went to. 
The reason that that's important is twofold. One is that if your residency program has or doesn't have a cardiology fellowship, that can help or hurt you. Simply put, one of the uh, places that you probably have a great shot at matching in is your own home institution. So if you have a fellowship program, that's great. If not, you know, you're probably in the same boat as many other people because not everyone, including myself, can match in their home institution. You simply only have so many spots. Now that point's kind of subtle, but it's also equally worthwhile understanding. And that's what the composition of your residency program or the residency program of the fellowship program that you're applying to is composed of. What I mean by that is, let's take my old residency program, for example, Drexel, RIP. At Drexel, we used to have eight cardiology spots. That's a pretty big program. Now my residency program had 40 residents, but inevitably not everyone wants to go into cardiology. I mean, it is like the best subspecialty, but you know, it's not for everyone, I get that. So one year, I think we had 14 people going into cardiology. You know, in general, there isn't a hard and fast rule of does a residency program or, or a fellowship program take however many people from their residency program, but most programs, most fellowship programs will take a large chunk of their own residents. They've been training these people, working side by side with them for three years. You know, they probably want to keep them if they know them well and they like them. So in a year where there are 14, 15 residents from my institution applying to those eight cardiology spots, that's going to not leave as many spots for everyone else who's applying from an external program. On the other side, if we only had one or two people applying for cardiology, that's gonna increase the number of spots available to everyone else. So this really has a bigger impact for smaller programs, for programs that only have one, two, three, four spots. That if there are only two spots in that fellowship and there are two applicants who they like, they're probably gonna keep them and that's gonna really hurt your chances of coming from an outside institution and matching into that program. Likewise, if there's no one applying that year for cardiology, you might have a better shot. All right, now let's finally get to the three most important things that you can actually make a difference about on your application. The three most important things when you're applying for fellowship are gonna be your research, your letters of recommendation, and your reputation. First, let's dive into research. This is gonna be a heavy topic. And again, I don't think that you need to take everything that I say uh, as a gold standard, but instead you should take it with a grain of salt. Every program director is gonna see things differently and see a cardiology fellowship through a different lens, and they're gonna look for different things in applicants. I can't predict what they're gonna have, but these are general rules that I've seen that are generally accepted throughout the field. So what's important when it comes to research? When you're looking at research with regards to applying to a fellowship, you have to look at things like a pyramid. At the top are gonna to be things that are uh, at presented at national or international conferences, things that you are the first author on, things that have big impacts. And as you go down, they will be things that you are either not the first author on, but maybe was at an international conference presented by someone else. Uh, something that was a case report, but presented at you know a, a regional conference. And as you get lower and lower, it'll be a case report or a case series that was presented at your home institution. Program directors aren't crazy. They understand that you're not gonna be able to be publishing double-blinded randomized control trials within three years of residency, but you might be able to get your name on one. All in all, I think that they want to see that you have an interest in the field and that you're trying to advance the science within it. There's no absolute rule of you need X, Y, and Z research in order to get a fellowship. But in general, if you have no research, you're really shooting yourself in the foot and really hurting your chances of getting any interviews. So the last two, your letters of recommendation and your reputation are quite intertwined with your first and that's your research. The letters of recommendation that you get should be coming from people who can speak on your reputation and have worked with you clinically or on your research. These should be people who are your mentors, people who have been giving you advice on how to get into a cardiology fellowship, Hopefully you aren't just getting all of your information from a YouTube video. Now I know I'm gonna be going off topic again, but this ties back into all three things and that's one of the most important pieces of applying for fellowship and that's trying to find a mentor. Trying to find a faculty member who can help guide you with your professional and likely personal life 
in maneuvering the application process and your professional career in general. Too long didn't read version of this is that letters of recommendation are just as important when applying to residency as they are with fellowship. With fellowship, the community gets even smaller and people know each other within the community. So if your mentor who writes you a letter of recommendation can make a call for you on your behalf and advocate that you're a worthwhile candidate to interview, that makes a huge difference. This brings me to the last piece, which is your reputation. By no means am I saying you gotta kiss the ass of all the cardiology fellows, but in general, you shouldn't be rubbing people the wrong way. So let's take a step back and just look at your timeline within residency. You've only got three years and you have to apply by the beginning of your third year. So when you're an intern, you have to presumably take step three of your MD or DO uh, licensing exams, as well as starting to do research. Hopefully you already know that you wanna do a specific specialty and that will allow you the time to do enough research to get that published. Because it takes some time to get the work uh, written down, all the work done in the research, and then find somewhere to accept it, publish it. So you're an intern in internal medicine, you survived the first few months, so did hopefully all your patients, and now you're kind of in the second quarter of your intern year. At some point, you should be looking at when to take step three. I've written two blog posts about the importance of step three or their lack of, as well as when you should be taking it. But the too long didn't read version of it is you basically only need like six weeks plus UWorld and you're gold. So whether you wanna take it sometime in the middle, I took mine, I think it was January, December, or if you wanna take it at the end, all you really need is about six weeks of maybe an elective time coupled with what I had when, with an X plus Y schedule where I had four weeks of elective coupled by one week of clinic where I had six weeks of a lighter schedule and I could focus on studying. I think that's all you really need. Knock it out, get it out of the way so you can start focusing on your research. The next step is again, finding a research project, getting published, and some of the most valuable resources are gonna be your senior residents. I know that for me, when I was an intern, I got involved in a few quality improvement projects and research projects simply by communicating that I was interested in cardiology and I sought out the guidance of some of my senior residents. The fellows are great resources as well. This goes back to the point of building a good reputation, but also just being able to do well in your own institution. Fellows are likely doing research and it'd be great if you could get, on, get in on one of their projects. Probably one of the most important and best resources are your attending physician. All of your attendings are great resources and if you're able to perform research with them, you might even be able to get a letter of recommendation with them because that gives you a greater ability to work with them, not just clinically, but also with research and on a long-term project. So hopefully sometime in your second year, you're completing research projects, uh, sending them to various conferences to submit them for publication or for poster or oral presentations. Because once July comes around at the end of your second year, when you become the badass third year senior residents and you have to take care of yet another class of interns, that's when you are gonna also be applying for cardiology fellowship. All right, so that breaks down mostly what internal medicine residents should really be looking for. What about the med students? So if you're a med student and you wanna go into a specialty or you have an interest in a specialty, that's great. I'm not gonna be the person to dissuade you from that, but you gotta acknowledge that things change. A lot of the people in my residency program went from wanting a specialty to just saying, I wanna be a hospitalist, practice, and stop being a, a resident. Other people went from GI to palm crit, palm crit to cardiology. Just keep an open mind. And at the end of the day, you really shouldn't be looking for programs that have strong cardiology fellowships. You need to just look for programs that have strong residency programs. Now I'm just gonna break down real quick what you should be looking for as a med student in residency programs. Most important thing, just like with real estate, with regard to residency programs is location, location, location. You're probably gonna be either with a spouse, maybe you're single, maybe you have a significant other, maybe you have kids. Maybe you have family on a certain coast of the United States. Maybe you wanna stick near a state. Maybe you just don't care and you wanna go anywhere. That's gonna be a huge factor of how you decide what residency programs to apply to. I know for me, I wanted to be in the Northeast, so I think 75% of my programs were in the tri-state area, and the rest of them were mostly on the East Coast, and every other one that was in the Midwest or West Coast were in large cities. Once you got location down, the next step that you gotta look for is simply, are they gonna take you? If you're a US med student, this probably doesn't even apply to you, 
because a lot of US med students only have to apply to like maybe 40 uh, programs. And again, I'm talking about internal medicine residents. Most Caribbean students have to apply to over 100. Now, if you're a Caribbean med student, I strongly recommend that you look at every single Caribbean med school, the big ones, Ross, St. George's, AUA, AUC, and look at where did those students match at what programs? Because simply put, there's no reason for you to apply to Harvard, they're not gonna take you. Especially if they've never taken a Caribbean med student. Sure, I found a few Harvard-like programs or Ivy League programs, top tier programs, that took one Caribbean med student in the last three, four, five years. But in general, you're just wasting your money if they've never taken one. Again, I still applied to one or two that have never taken them, because who knows, there's always gotta be a first, might as well be you but I wouldn't spend too much of your money applying to those type of schools. Now again, if you're gonna be applying for a residency program and you found a location, you found programs that are gonna look at you and interview you because people who have gone to your uh, school have been interviewed and accepted to those programs, the next, and you are specifically a med student who's interested in a subspecialty, let's say you know 100% that you wanna be a cardiologist. I would still not prioritize a program that has an amazing cardiology department over one that has an amazing internal medicine residency program. Hopefully they're one or the same. Hopefully if they have a great subspecialty fellowship like cardiology, then they probably have a great internal medicine residency program, but it doesn't always work that way. And lastly, the fun part of when you're on your application interviews, the three things that I really looked at when I was looking at my rank list for residency programs is again, location, and then the second two parts that I felt were really important was how well did I get along with the residents there and how well did I get along with the other applicants? These are gonna be people that you're supposed to be working with side by side for the next two to three years. If you hated all of them, then maybe that group of people that you are applying with or are planning to work with are not a great fit for you. Maybe that program has something underlying it that doesn't vibe well with you. I'm not saying that you shouldn't rank a program highly because you didn't get along with people on interview day, but maybe it's indicative of a bigger problem. The third part that is probably, again, not a reason to rank a place higher or lower, but again, is a red flag and indicative of bigger problems deeper seated within the established residency program is their lunch. If they can't treat you to a good first date, how are you expected to date them for three years? Look, I went to some programs and they took us to their cafeteria. And let me tell you, it was an impressive cafeteria. Fresh sushi, great grill, salad bar on point. But then I went to another cafeteria and it's like a typical hospital cafeteria that is like in a horror movie and they were like proud to take us to their cafeteria for some reason. And that wasn't why I ranked them low. I ranked them low because they didn't have the stuff that I was looking for. The program director seemed really strange and all the residents that were there, I didn't get along with and I just had a really bad vibe when I left that hospital. But the bad lunch was icing on the cake. Not to mention that they fed us right before interviews. They gave us the tour, fed us, got us all gluttonous and tired, took away the coffee, and then started interviewing us. I don't know if that was on purpose, but if it was, that's even worse. And if it wasn't, I mean, come on guys, can't even do a first date right? And again, there were other programs that fed us well, brought in dessert, gave us goodie bags on the way out, and I didn't rank them highly simply because they had a good lunch, but that good lunch, was indicative of everything else that was positive about that place. And I left them feeling really good and really warm and wanting to rank them highly and wanting to be a co-resident with all those people who I felt a jovial and positive experience with on interview day. So sorry for some of my rambling, but those are the big points of how to become a cardiologist in the US. You gotta have great letters of recommendation, be a good doctor, get some research. And when you're looking for a residency program, you gotta first, look for a good residency program. And if they have a good fellowship program, that's a bonus. But you shouldn't preclude a residency program because they don't have that subspecialty because things change. You might not wanna go into that specialty or you might change the type of specialty that you wanna go into. And again, bad lunch isn't a reason not to match with the program. 
but it's a big red flag. I'm suspicious if you have a bad lunch. So I hope this video helps. If it did, subscribe below. If you have any comments, comment below, and I'll be sure to get to them as soon as I can.